On this episode of DLN Extend, we discuss whether or not Linux is always the right solution. This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean and Bitwarden. Welcome to episode 48 of DLN Extend. DLN Extend is a community-powered podcast. We take conversations from around the DLN network from places like the Discourse Forms, Telegram Group, Discord Server, and more. We also grab topics from around the network and give you our takes. With me this week are my two fantastic co-hosts, Nate, the king of Open Sousa, and Matt, our gaming host on the network. I would say I'm more of a court gesture. <laughs> The one that wears the funny hat. <laughs> I'd say within our community, you are you take the cake. You are the king of open Susa. And I would go so far as to say the king with an unhealthy obsession. Almost. Almost unhealthy obsession. <laughs> no. If you're king, it's totally unhealthy. <laughs> just saying. I guess. We'll just have to agree to disagree on that one. So what have you been up to, Nate? Well, lots of exciting things. Well, not really that exciting. I've been playing with getting my gaming on. Not gaming like in the Matt Ooh. gaming, but Game Boy emulation again. I'd received a lot of comments on an article I wrote about Visual Boy Advance that I ran on OpenSUSE. I got a lot of feedback and I didn't realize how vibrant of a community the Game Boy emulation scene is. It's actually pretty astounding, really, how much is going on there. They have like this quite a, a matrix, uh, this shootout, as it's called, of different emulators. And I kind of went from middle of the pack and one that I knew was on OpenSUSE and had a like, bunch of sources for it. MGBA, I'm sure you may have heard of it. I'm sure Matt's heard of it because he hears of everything at least once. Whether or not he retains it's another issue, but it's a Game Boy emulator. <laughs> Sorry, did you say something, Nate? <laughs> no, not this time. Uh, Game Boy emulator runs on Linux. I think it runs on other, other platforms too, but I don't really care. Installation is pretty easy. There's an RPM for OpenSUSE, of course. You can also choose a flat pack or snap. So I kind of covered all the bases in my little article that I wrote up on it. I didn't have really high standards for an emulated game because I just expected a certain amount of like clunkiness. The Game Boy wasn't exactly a buttery smooth system back in the day. And so what I like about this, it's a very highly functional Game Boy emulator. The features that it gives you are more than what I need to ever even dig into. Things like filtering or like visuals filtering and whatnot or exact pixel reproduction so that there's no like odd scaling. A pixel per pixel or you like a 2x scale so it increases the area by four times. So you can do exact pixel pixel scaling or adjusted pixel scaling, but not that a screen that's like 166 by 200 or whatever it is, is going to require anything exact. It's a real tiny screen. So there's a lot of really neat little features in this. It's also real buttery smooth, as in there's less jittery or less weirdness in this emulator than I've experienced in my Game Boy past. It's actually an improved gaming experience using the emulator, which I think should be noted. I just did a little quick little article on it. I've already had some positive feedback on it, which is nice. You even got it featured in a gaming emulation website out there as well. Nate, you'd be surprised how big the emulation scene is just in general. They're really getting down into preservation, basically, of video game culture, of history. And I think that's pretty amazing that they're putting that much into it. Maybe people want to admit it or not. Games are in many ways a part of our culture. And I think the preservation of this little bit of digital culture, I think, is just as important as any other historic culture you know, from my perspective. And I think the emulation mm -hmm. helps to do that, helps to tell that story. It's kind of like your own little museum on your lap laptop of sorts or your computer that you can explore this history of gaming. And I just really appreciate that to a huge extent. Matt, what exciting things do you have going on in your world? Yet again, I have more new hardware. Really? Yay! Actually new or is it like just new to you hardware? No, no, no. This is new, new hardware, not new to me hardware. Paint me green and call me Gumby. I didn't know you actually bought new hardware. I thought all your hardware was secondhand. A gen or two behind yeah. your... <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Not judging here. Pot meat kettle. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, I picked up an HP Omen, which is the gaming versions of uh, HP's laptops. Like an Alienware? Yeah, it'd be like their version of Alienware or like Lenovo's Legion line. Same kind of deal. Okay. Very gamer focused and that kind of stuff. Now, when you say gamer focused, what does that mean, gamer focused? I see those words in the marketing mumbo jumbo. I'm like, I don't know what that means. When I say gamer focused, it's a Windows machine right now. There's particular reasons for that. It has what Wendy would call rainbow colored vomit on the keyboard as an example example, where it does like pulses and breathe effects and rainbow vomit, as Wendy would so eloquently put it. My fantastically coined term. I, I do like that, yes. Things that make it like gamer quote unquote focus is design aesthetic. It's a lot of angular design on the, the actual hardware. Not 
quite industrial like Yuri Lee book or something will be, which is more like industrial design. It's very straight edged and all that kind of stuff. This is more angular design and that kind of stuff. It has certain things that gamers would care about. It's a 144 hertz screen on it. Does that really make a difference? The higher refresh rate? To me, I can't see anything, I think, greater than 60. The ideal play rate should be a solid 60 frame base. The reason higher is better is because think of it this way. It'd be like going from a first gen Android phone. It works. Things seem smooth. Then you go to like a OnePlus 7T in my case. And then you try using a new version of Android on top of it. It's a night and day difference. And once you go back to the first one, it's a lot harder not to see the stuff that's on the newer one. That high refresh rate makes for a better one-to-one ratio on like mouse movements and that kind of stuff. Small mouse movements are smoother, so you can get more precise aiming. It gets down to like really nitty-gritty details, and you can mess around with like the DPI on your mouse and all the other sensor stuff. Add weights. Wendy's already talking about how much she's actually likes using gaming mice, which is weird. I do. It was surprising to me when I got my first gaming mouse. It does help in gaming, though it didn't make me a better gamer. But I love how much smoother it was. I love the fact that I could added weights to the bottom of the mouse and I made sure that it fit what I needed for comfort. I will never go back to just a standard mouse. I absolutely love the gaming mouse. I feel like getting things like gaming mouse, gaming keyboard, gaming computer just eliminates all my excuses for why I'm terrible at games. And I don't know if I want to go down that road. I mean, in all honesty, just look at the episode of GameSphere. Ryan's the first guest. You can see how terrible he is at game. So, you know, hey. No to everybody who ever plays a game with Ryan. If he tells you timeout, don't trust him. It's not <laughs> actually a timeout. He'll just shoot you. Yeah, he will shoot you in the face still. That's kind of what a gaming focused machine is more than anything else. I've been looking for a GPU replacement in my desktop. GPUs, being GPUs right now, the cheapest route is actually just to get a whole new machine. Really? Absolutely crazy. This isn't top of the line. It's a Core i5, 16 gigs of RAM, came with a 512 NVMe, NVIDIA RTX 2060 for under $1,000. Which is amazing for right now. Even the laptop prices have been bad. It's harder to get CPUs even for them. It's harder to get GPUs even for them. So that has raised the overall price of everything. Mm -hmm. That's a really good deal. The only con is, and some people may or may not like this, it's staying a Windows machine just because of the RTX stuff. I want to see what all the hubbub is about. From what I've seen of RTX, TX is is just prettier lighting effects on surfaces and stuff. That's pretty much all I've gotten and seen from it so far. Scanning their site, they have some of those machines with the Ryzen in it. Yeah, yeah, I wanted the Ryzen ones, but those are just too much out of my price range. Yeah, they're definitely higher. Yeah. The nice thing is, this is expandable. You can actually crack the machine open. It's got room for regular 2.5 drive, so I have on order a terabyte SSD for the 2.5 drive slot. You can upgrade the RAM, and you have access to like most of the cooling and all that kind of stuff. Redo the thermal paste, Wendy. Yay! Which I think really needs to be done on everything after at least five years. Yeah, definitely. That's been my biggest thing. I also got sent a wireless microphone kit to review. Well, that should be fun. I didn't have a system to actually use that on because it uses a 3.5, no, not 3.5, it uses the bigger jack into the audio. I had to pick up a Behringer 502 USB for $50. Like an XLR or is it the, like the quarter inch jack? It's the quarter inch jack, but it's a multifunctional wireless system. So you can have two microphones on the same wireless system. Doesn't play too well with taking the quarter inch jack and plugging it into a 3.5. Can't use an adapter. Yeah, I'm testing that out. I've done a few other mic reviews and stuff, so it's been interesting. I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. More information to come. Wendy, what have you been up to? I edited the last episode and was kind of disappointed in the way the sound came out. I was wanting to edit it without any external auto processing. We've been using Zencaster in the past and it really does have great auto processing, but we haven't had very good luck with it always uploading the audio, both on this show and on Hardware Addicts. We've had issues with that. So what's the point of using it if the audio that we're sending to it to make sure that we're sounding our best is actually getting uploaded properly. So we switch to a different distance podcaster. It doesn't have auto processing. And there were parts of the last episode that I was disappointed in. So there were points in my audio where there was some distortion, especially on the high end. I didn't like that. And then the audio wasn't as even as I'd liked as it was in the past. 
And I wanted to make sure that I could take and use the whole power of audacity. I think it's an application a lot like dark table. There is so much there. And overall, the application is extremely powerful. But if you do not know how to use those tools properly or what they do or in what order is best to use them in, you can get yourself into trouble. I started taking an Audacity class on Udemy, Udemy, however you want to pronounce that website name. And it's been really, really good so far. I'm still in the intro portion of the class, which is a lot of the stuff that I already knew, though I did learn a few keyboard shortcuts that I wasn't aware of. That'll definitely speed things along. But I didn't want to jump through the class early on thinking that, oh, this is something I knew. And then like that, miss some really important information that was going to be built upon later. So I'm taking it from start to finish all the way through the entire thing so that I can get the absolute most out of Audacity. You know, I never thought about taking an Audacity class before, but it makes sense, really. You know, I use it. I use it all the time, but I'm sure I'm only, actually, I know I'm only scratching the surface of it. So I'd be interested in hearing how you've improved your efficiency in using it with some of these learnings that you're acquiring. All I can say is control I is definitely going to be your friend when the <laughs> using the keyboard to alternate between the select tool and the cut tool, the move tool, and all that stuff. That helps tremendously as opposed to actually having to sit there and mouse over everything get really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> now that's cool. I look forward to seeing maybe you can pass on some of that knowledge. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> uh, definitely appreciate it. As much as I like certain post-processing applications and stuff that are out there for automating that process, having some self-reliance and being able to do it yourself, if it's not how exactly you want it, is a really nice thing to do and have. So I definitely look forward to seeing what you get from these classes. I will share as I continue to go through this class. I'd like to finish it this week. Some of the more advanced stuff is what I need to make sure that I can get the audio quality right where I want it. And we're getting great files through these different programs that we're using. We could record locally. We've done that in the past. Record locally and then send whoever's editing all of the files and then you have to match up where things line up. Thankfully, I've never had to do that, but I've heard from you two and other people what a nightmare that is to get all the audio lined up. So using these different services, make sure that each track starts recording at exactly the same time. There's no syncing there big benefit. So we have that quality audio that way. But then it's just making sure editing it properly. And I know there were times in the beginning when I was working on images, and I've learned and things changed and I've gotten better. And I look back at some of those past edits and I'm like, "Ooh, that's really cringy. There's a better way to do that. And just knowing that with images, I knew there had to be a better way for audacity there's people out there that use these programs all the time that already have that knowledge. And it was a situation of seek out someone smarter than me, seek out someone who has already taken the time to learn it and now willing to share that knowledge. And so far, I really like the guy who's teaching this class. He's had some really great information. I like the way he presents it. We'll be able to compare the next two episodes and see how they sound differently. This episode of DLN Extended is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. DigitalOcean recently announced new features and services such as a virtual private cloud in all regions, free of charge. This lets you create multiple private networks to isolate your workloads. Container Registries is now available to all users. Easily store and manage private container images and push images seamlessly to DigitalOcean's Kubernetes. You can get all of this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. Get started on DigitalOcean for free with $100 credit by going to do.co slash dln and you can use that $100 credit for spinning up over a dozen droplets or even some monster-sized droplets for two months. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. I know that Audacity will be a perfect solution for me and our podcast. I'm even using it on Linux. Is Linux always the right solution for your project, what you're doing, whether it's work or play? Short answer, yes. Okay, that's it. Show ended. All right. Okay, well, it's a good show, everybody. Short answer, I think it is always the right solution for me. Always want to caveat that with 
for me, because if it's not running on Linux, it just doesn't work with my breadth of equipment here. I like some flexibilities. When it comes to like general web browsing, communicating, I don't really see why Linux isn't going to work 10 times out of 10. I really don't. There may be some edge cases. There are always edge cases. On my machine, I have Firefox, of course, for web browsing. I have Chromium. I also have Chrome. I got Microsoft Edge. What else is there? Okay, I know there's Brave and Vivaldi, but those are either based on the Firefox or the Chrome base Blink browser. Ultimately, like, what is it that I cannot do on my Linux machine that a web service or web application or web whatever that I can't do in Linux? I'm not sure of anything at this time. I mean, we are using a web application right now with this Riverside FM on Chromium for me. We're able to do this show. It's not like I can't do my job with Destination Linux. If I couldn't do Destination Linux work on Linux, then I might be pretty sad. I have Microsoft Teams, so I can do that if I need to use that with other employment that I have the Google suite, which with a previous employer. So I'm not really sure what I can't do there. I mean, do you guys have any situations where the web browser and communication software in Linux was inadequate? Yes, <laughs> specifically because I am a big gamer. I will be the first to admit Linux isn't always potentially the right solution for gaming. I would go so far though as to say that when it comes to emulation, if you look at a lot of the mini consoles and a lot of that stuff, like mini NES and like the mini Sega Genesis and all those systems, they're all Linux powered. In those situations, Linux is definitely the right solution. And maybe this is the edge case. If you insist to have as much much game compatibility as possible instead of the 75 80 percent that we might have now with things like proton if you insist on much higher percentage than official support unfortunately windows is kind of the only way to go if you want to build a micro pc for couch gaming big picture mode or whatever however you want to do it Linux is a great if you're looking at it from just a console mentality, but if you're looking for a compatibility thing, it's going to be Windows. Are there really that many games that will not run on Linux at this point? What percentage of games am I going to have a lousy experience on with Linux? It's not so much the percentage. It's about what is playable. Because of the games I prefer, Linux works perfectly fine for me. But people who rely on games like Fortnite, PUBG, and all these Battle Royale games. But people still play those? I thought Fortnite was like last year. Yeah, there are other games. Tom Clancy's Breaking Point or whatever it's called now. You have to have the anti-cheat stuff enabled yeah. in order for it to play at all. And that currently is not available in Linux. That's a problem for some people. Some people it's not. Like for people like me, I don't care because I find survival and battle royale games to be less than stellar. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I can't even survive through the first 10 minutes of Doom. So I'm not playing those games. So you fit in right well with Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wait, you mean there are other 3D shooters besides Doom? I'm so confused. Yes. There are, amazingly. There Wolfenstein. Are. Well, that's right. Wolfenstein and Doom. Those are the two that people play these days, right? Quake. Yo, Quake, Duke Nukem. There's four. <laughs> you just added one on your own, man. And Descent. Descent. Of course, Descent. <laughs> uh, look at those lists are rolling. Yep. I think that's it. But in fairness, if those type of games matter to you, like if those are the games that you only play, Linux might not be the right solution. I'm not saying it's not the right solution. It's kind of a situational thing. Golly, you went right for the gaming throat, didn't you? Yeah, he did. Where, you know, you were talking about the general web browsing and Matt went straight to gaming. And in general web browsing or the communications, I can see it as the best solution because that's the way that I've best been able to communicate. I've had issues in the past, especially with trying to get things to work, especially after Windows has done an update, because it will have issues even with some of its own applications. After those, and I'm not saying that Linux doesn't. I've had my own issues after an update with a Linux system, but I know that every time my in laws fire up their computer, and that's exactly what they're using it for they're web browsing, they're checking some social media stuff, they're checking email, playing a little bit of solitaire. There you go, there's some gaming. See? There is nothing <laughs> that Linux cannot do for their needs. And it absolutely is the right solution for them. Not dealing with some of the virus stuff, not dealing with some of the pop-up stuff that is more within web browser type thing. It really comes down to general browsing and computing and gaming. What games are you playing? What are you needing it for? 
Then you jump to Matt and you have some of these AAA games, some of these things that absolutely have to have these anti-cheats running because people are people. (laughs) You have to have the Microsoft system in order to do that. And I would caveat that with if you are wanting to play some games and not wanting to tinker with making them work, because there are some games that will run on Linux, but you have to do some tinkering. Well, okay, I have to sidestep that as there was a Windows game that I couldn't get to run on Windows because, well, Windows. That was the situation of I needed an additional file in order to make it work, as I've talked about before. And because all of the places to get that were horribly shady and I didn't trust any of them, that game didn't run. Windows has its own issues when it comes to running games as well. I'm not saying Windows doesn't. I was taking it from the point, specifically as it relates to gaming, that people want to talk about compatibility and the one that's going to give them the biggest swath of compatibility, if depending on your gaming selection, is going to be Windows because that's the one it's quote unquote developed for. That's just unfortunately kind of the reality. I do agree. DLLs are still a thing in Windows, despite what people say. (laughs) There is another situation where you raise into Wendy that Linux might not have been the best solution and it does kind of relate to gaming but it also ties into the education stuff. This is a situation of she needed to run the education version of Minecraft for a class. It wouldn't run on the Linux system that we had even in multi-MC. It had to have Windows so that left us with a system that needed to be booting into different drives and yes I do want my Windows if I need it on a specific system to be completely on its own drive I do not want it to touch my Linux drive. So that means booting back and forth between the two. Overall, I didn't find it a good solution at all. It was the situation that I had to use in order to get that to run, but I would by no means call it a best solution. Oh, definitely. That's why we're asking, is Linux always the right solution? Because in that particular case, the only viable solution or the right solution to fix the problem is unfortunately go to the thing you nobody really wants to, let's be real. Yeah. I think that does play a part. But overall, though, for everything else, besides that one particular incident, has Lennox not been a viable option for doing kids homeschooling and that kind of stuff? For school, it's been absolutely the best thing ever. I know that I can hand them a laptop. The kids know how to use it. I'm not worried about, hey, they're firing up this laptop. My daughter has a paper to do and now she's sitting there and waiting for an update to happen so she can start working on her paper. None of that is stuff that we run into. Every software that they need has worked. There's been times like what we're recording the show on right now. It's a web browser based application. They've done certain things like that through school. Another area that kind of ties into all three of us, really, content creation. Now, this can be a sticky subject for some and not for others. Right. Nate, as far as the content you create, you know, the YouTube videos that you do, managing your website and all that kind of stuff, Linux is obviously the right solution for you. Yep. I think it's the best solution. I'm sure there are solutions I could do just as well with that are proprietary. I have no doubt that there are proprietary solutions that would work just as well, maybe even better. The issue comes down to, do I want to use those applications? I use Caden Live all the time, not necessarily for stuff I put on YouTube, but also for cutting up and putting together things for memory work for my kids. I download bits of what other people put together. And then for personal use, I'll cut those up and repeat those just so I can get those other sections because I need to remember the things too in order to teach the kids. And so it helps me just as well. It makes it a lot more automatic. That's kind of a combination of home education and content creation. I do quite a bit of that. Or a lot of times I'll get some really awful audio quality out of something and I can enhance it using Audacity to make it sound better and then you know, do the looping and cutting whatever else that I need to do. But I find that for content creation in that regard, yeah, I think the open source tools on Linux, or even some of the closed source tools, I haven't used them. Maybe I should try them out at some point in time. They work great in Linux. It's an awesome experience. It's very reliable. Nothing's crashy. These days, I don't think crashing really happens on my systems. I'm pretty impressed there. I mean, I'm sure there are holes somewhere. I could be more efficient by learning, like, you know, when he's learning Audacity. I could probably take course learning Pain and Live to be quicker with that as well, or even seeing how other people edit stuff might be helpful. For content creation, I think Linux, it has it. OBS, and if you use OBS for stuff, that is kind of the gold standard when it comes to like online streaming and such. And that is born in the open source. Content creation in Linux is top notch. Wendy, you're a content creator by profession. Linux has been the right solution in that regard. It has been the right solution for me in that regard, but it's because there is some 
very powerful software, as I was mentioning earlier, Darktable, that I can do that with. Now, you take somebody who they've spent their entire time working on images, they in that Adobe software, then you are not getting that to run on a Linux system, you would have to use a Windows system. So for them, they would say quite the opposite, you must have a Windows or a Mac system, not Linux, in order to run Adobe in order to create and change and edit these images. I also see a lot of that when it comes to video editing, because that suite is so popular and this kind of flashes back to last week's episode, because that suite is so popular and it is being taught and those tools are very refined, you'll find a lot of content creators, say on YouTube, would say, you can't use Linux for that. I've even watched some reviews or they're saying you can't use Linux because this is the software I use. And as someone with a workflow, it's really hard to change programs. I know that my mentor, other people in the past, I wouldn't tell them, well, you have to use Linux. It's so much better. It is definitely better for me. I have a very good workflow down, especially when it comes to images. I'm working on audio and video. Both of those I'm not so great with yet. We're getting there. But I wouldn't tell them you have to use this solution or this solution is absolutely the best because their workflow is so ingrained with that additional software for them making the change between a Linux system or a Mac Windows system would be extremely difficult. It's not just the operating system lying underneath their whole workflow would be turned upside down. To play a little bit of the devil's advocate, there are certain features and functions that aren't necessarily in a lot of the Linux content creation stuff, specifically around video. I want to kind of nail that down. Things like raw therapy and dark table and a lot of the photography and image creation stuff is very refined, very featureful. Where certain things fall specifically in the Linux sphere of video is Caden Lab doesn't have hardware encoding decoding. You can kind of pipe it through shortcut to Caden Live in order to do that. But for those that like Caden Live but want the back end rendering of shortcut, there's actually a solution to do that. Or the other option is just go use shortcut. Certain features are missing and it's not a thing that we can just be like, oh, well, it's there if you really, really want it. We use Caden Live as the gold standard when it comes to like specifically video stuff. And it's really good for video. I'm not saying it's not. If we're going to be real video encoding and decoding stuff, it's not there. And that is a really big thing because scrubbing through a timeline and when it's all janky and everything else, because, you know, it's all CPU bound. <laughs> I know in Wendy's case, when you got what, 16, 12 cores, 16 cores, whatever you got, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. For weaker systems, that does come into play because you don't have a smooth scroll through your timeline. I think this also can kind of go back to our topic last week. This is a great tie in between the two. There is proprietary software that will run on Linux that has some of these more advanced features, say the open source ones don't have. So you could still Mm -hmm. use Linux as your base, use a proprietary software on top of that, and still have Linux being the best solution for you. It boils down to the user. If you're looking to switch, you're showing that you have somewhat of an open mind. So if you're switching from one to another, why would you not do that with the understanding that applications might be a little different? But on the same note, I also understand that for those who are entrenched in a workflow or a sphere, for them, time is money kind of deal. And I understand that. People find that Linux doesn't have whatever application they're used to, and that affects them financially. I can totally get why they might not view Linux as the right solution for them. As far as me personally for content creation, Linux is probably a good 99% of the time for what I need to do. Now, there's an argument to be made, though, when going with proprietary software you essentially have no say as to how the project changes or develops or whatever. So if they choose to change the workflow on you, which you know may or may not happen, I do know that some applications this has happened to me in the past. Once they change the workflow, there's no way of getting back what you want. A lot of these open source projects, they have the plugins and the flexibility to give you a workflow of your choice. There's something to be said about the choice that open source software does have. Not to circle back on last week's discussion, but here we go. For certain portions, Linux might be the right solution because they don't care. They might use KMLive or Shotcut or DaVinci Resolve or whatever. They have the right application on the right platform. They don't care. If you can't have the application you need on the platform you're looking at, it might not be an option. That's understandable, especially if they view it from a business perspective. 
In your case, Nate, you are right. Things like when the ribbon interface was introduced in Office 2007 and people 14 years later complain about it still. <laughs> things like the Final Cut, I think it was Final Cut 10, that took out a bunch of things and changed a bunch of stuff and just made Final Cut a worse product. Adobe going to their crappy subscription model and telling people who had older versions that you could no longer activate them. <laughs> I totally get where you're coming from. Is Linux the right solution for development and do-yourself projects? I think it's the only solution, personally. I visit Instructables somewhat frequently, and they have like these really great ideas. A lot of them run on open source software of some sort. They run on Raspberry Pis or Arduinos. Not everything on the Arduino is open source. Applications they put on there are open source. They are something you pulled on from GitHub. The environments to work on these things, those IDEs, are on Linux. I would go so far as to say that the experience of running those development environments and Windows is subpar compared to Linux. For the do-it-yourself world, for those that like to develop things or come up with ideas or create something new, I really believe wholeheartedly that Linux is the solution for that. Hey, I may be wrong, but I am on a Destination Linux podcast, so I would say Linux is absolutely the only solution. I'm here because I believe that. Like you, Nate, I do a lot of appliance and DIY kind of stuff, hardware projects. Not in the same scope or scale that you do. Weird stuff that I'm interested in trying. I think any type of DIY appliance or you can look at it, computers however you want. I think Linux is really the only solution because you can custom tailor generic Linux to the hardware. Sometimes you have to do a, little, a lot more tinkering and you can make the hardware work with Linux. Whereas trying to put a horseshoe on a pig kind of situation, if you're dealing with Windows embed and all that kind of stuff, it's not a pretty thing. When it comes to DIY appliances and that kind of developmental stuff, I think Linux is really, honestly, really the only solution. You can talk about FreeBSD and all the other stuff. Linux is going to be the one with the most robust support because you have things like the Arduinos, the Raspberry Pis, and all that stuff. Well, Linux distros tailor versions of their distro for that, like the Ubuntu for Raspberry Pi. I believe there's a bunch of other generic ARM64 based ISOs out there for a lot of these other projects too. So Linux really covers the field when it comes to the DIY projects, honestly. I think there are some areas where Windows might have kind of a leg up because of legacy stuff, like some of the older 10, 15 year ago projects or, or platforms. But those platforms are being replaced bit by bit by the open source projects that are developed in Linux. It'll be interesting to see how things progress from here. There are other things besides ARM that are kind of hitting the scene, like the RISC-V or RISC-V, whatever you want to call it. That's one platform that will be interesting to see how that plays out, which is also an open source platform. But as far as Linux being the number one on that, there might be some other smaller embedded type systems. You can make the argument that there's still OS2 warp out there. So flat block well, that's too, true. Because it does run on some ATMs and stuff. There's other platforms that are there. I'm talking, I guess, general purpose, one that'll cover the most ground and you can kind of tailor. I think Linux is probably the option that most would go for. In my case, if I wanted to make a main machine to do fighters and arcade cabinet kind of stuff, I could do that on a Raspberry Pi cabinet. Works best on Linux. Yep. Or an emulation machine. I think that's another strong area for Linux as well. We've talked about a lot of our DIY projects. Wendy, you also make some DIY projects on your own. Has Linux been the solution for them all? I don't have enough knowledge in this area to be like, yes, one way or the other. I do have to say one of my first experiences with Linux was an ISO that was built specifically for Moto X. It was the first smartphone I ever owned and it didn't take long before I was into <laughs> rooting it. And at the time, it didn't <laughs> have a... yeah. Jumped into that right away. It didn't last very long. Yeah, why not? Didn't have an unlocked bootloader. And so you had to do like these funky side things in order to get ROMs side loaded onto this device. And you never completely overwrit the original ROM. But my first experience with Linux was I'd found this ISO and I can't remember if it was to roll back and go to the base or if it was to help make tweaks and put a new ROM on it. Downloaded it, of course, wrote the ISO in the days of CD, right? I wasn't writing it to a USB, fired this thing up in order to tinker on my Android device. In running Fastboot, I have to say my favorite system to do that on, hands down, is Linux. Most distros typically come with Android tools built into it. I've never had any issues running Fastboot ADB on a Linux system. And I think part of that is because, you know, that stuff is built in, it's ready to go. I've had times where, you know, you got to make sure you run sudo before running the command or it's saying, you know, I can't find this device or whatever. 
that kind of tinkering, yeah, without a doubt. I'm 100% Linux only. You jumped into the root and ROM sphere real quick. <laughs> That's the area that I know the best, and I haven't dabbled in it as much lately. That's what brought me into tinkering was actually Android devices. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm not really shocked by that. Here, here's my version of Android. Wow, you're terrible. Go away. Exactly. Well, and the other thing that I like so much about the rooting and ROMing aspect of it is you typically get more security updates that's what brought me to it. I wanted some features that stock Android doesn't give me. And I wanted the control over my device that stock Android typically doesn't give you, aka there is crapware. Crapware. <laughs> whatever you want to call it. <laughs> On my phone, I don't want to use this. How can I get this off? That led me down the path of rooting and roaming, which also helped eventually lead me down the path to Linux. This episode of DLN Extend is sponsored by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the password manager that we use and trust. Bitwarden lets you set up things like a pin to easily access your password manager, as well as additional authentications such as a master password and adding phrases to fingerprint security, all to keep your passwords safe. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and businesses to store, share, and sync their sensitive data. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. There are many reasons why I chose Bitwarden as my personal password manager. One of those reasons, it is 100% open source. You can also self-host your Bitwarden instance. They also offer security audits to make sure your passwords are as secure as they can possibly be. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. They offer a premium account for just $10 per year. What do you get with that premium account? One gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, or Duo, Vault Health Reports, TOTP authenticator storage and generation. Priority customer support. Make the smart move like many of the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. If you're like me though, you'll want that premium account for just $10 per year to support this amazing open source software. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. Speaking of super awesome tinkering project, I am Excited to hear how your dementia-friendly media player is going. You got some updates for us, Nate? I do. This weekend, I picked up from a friend a broken, like, old-timey-looking radio. It's not actually old-timey. It's a modern thing with, like, a cassette deck. Okay, how modern is a cassette deck? It has a cassette deck thing on the side of it, AM, FM receiver, but it doesn't work. Is dead. So I'm going to remove all the electronics out of that and I'm going to mount my Arduino and all the different components inside of that. It's got a speaker in it and everything. So I'll put everything together and use that as my test bed so I can then put in my own knobs and everything else. It does have two extra knobs. I'm not sure what to do with other than just leave them there. Hopefully it doesn't confuse my mother. I'll just tell her. I mean, if it does, it does, right? Maybe I can think of some additions to it in the future. But right now, I just want to get the thing done, assembled, and in her hands so she can utilize it. Pretty excited about it. Not too many components, really. The build material is really quite small. A lot of things that I just have around the house, around my super cubicle, I should say. You know, the wires, the resistors, the all the different little nitinoid components that make the electronics run. I don't have to find a dedicated power supply for it. I'm sure I have one of my bin O power supplies that I have on my shelf. Yes, I have a bin, a large bin of just power supplies that I've accumulated over the years. Very handy, and I've blown up many of them with my experiments. So once you let the magic blue smoke, they just don't work anymore, and they smell awful. I want to make sure everything doesn't smell awful, get it all assembled, and in my mom's hands, hopefully, by this weekend. I'll try and take pictures. I don't know if it's video-worthy. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. The big hurdle for me was something to put it in besides corrugated cardboard. I love the picture that you shared in our little group. I think it's going to look extremely awesome in that case. I would love to have something that looks older like that, but have newer hardware in it just for fun. I have this desire. What can I put Linux into? Now, in this case, it's just an Arduino powered thing. So it's not really Linux. Could use a Raspberry Pi Linux powered, but that's kind of overkill. How can I jam Linux into this old appliance cabinet? That's kind of where I am right now in life. I'm not sure what that means. I do know that it means for this obsession, Linux is the right choice always. Well, overkill is underrated. So let's see how powerful we can make this media player. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> how I want to go for it. We can, you know, can have it maybe doing some um, <laughs> cryptocurrency mining while it's sitting there playing audio or something like that. There you go. It can be a heater for winter. That's right. My mother will enjoy that in the wintertime. Not so much in the summertime. Well, Matt, what do you have to enable us with this week? 
I am currently playing a game called Altier Rise of the Ever Darkness and the Secret Hideout. I love Japanese RPG names. <laughs> that is long. I think Michael would enjoy that as much as some of those hardware names. It's not your typical out to save the world tropey RPG that you would normally get. This is like a coming of age RPG. There's combat and that kind of stuff. There's the typical genre staples. The overall story is just growing up and coming into your own in the world. And I think that's kind of really why I like the game. It's really different in that regard. Not something you would normally see. I'm playing it on Switch right now, but it is available on PC. There is also a sequel, which I haven't gotten to yet. For those that want to play it on Linux, it's gold rated. I did look at the Steam DB listings. If you're going to play it and you're going to buy it, use a version of 5.0. I think it's 13. Don't use the newer 5.13 stack. It doesn't work from what I saw with just generic Steam play as a filter on ProtonDB. Things like the intro movies don't play and that kind of stuff. It's not a great experience. That's the caveat if you're a Linux gamer. So it does work if you use the older version of Proton. I'm really enjoying it. I clicked on the link. Are the graphics of the game like what you see in the trailer? Because it looks like a cartoon animation. Like it all looks like very cartoony looking. Yeah, a uh, cell shaded kind of effect that they're going for for okay. the game. It does have kind of a cartoony feel to it. It's very cute looking. Maybe some of the proportions I'm not sure about. Definitely some of the proportions are a little larger than life. I did <laughs> say it's a bit trophy. So in <laughs> fairness. What's interesting though is like their outfits that they're wearing. It kind of reminds me of like 1800s colonial. No, that's not right. The 1700s colonial. In some of it, yeah, except for the Daisy Dukes, the ones way. Right, yeah, that one. I'm not sure about the, uh, the guy with the yeah, half, half shirt. shirt, like the belly shirt, the 1980s looking. Yeah. A little bit weird, but yeah, whatever. Welcome to the world of Japanese RPGs, dude. One of the other things I like about it is science, according to these game universe, is a continuation of alchemy. Making potions and all that kind of stuff is actually really part and parcel for the society and like that medieval kind of approach. It brings like a crafting element to it. It's a different take on some of the traditional Japanese RPG stuff. Not all of that. This game must have a lot of overall gameplay because I know you mentioned before, last week in particular, that you want a game to have at least one hour of gameplay per dollar you spend. And this one's definitely more on the expensive side. Certainly. So you've got lots and lots of time playing it then? It's about 40 hours, but I'm more of a slow burn. I like to explore the world and... A typical 40 hours is like a rush job from what I've seen from people. So I can easily get another 20 hours of this by like exploring the world and all that kind of stuff. So I'll get close to pretty much what I spent. So I'm not too worried. I mean, it's really not terribly out of line, the price. To quibble over $50 for a a very well-designed game is not too expensive. Not to sound like Old Man River here, but 20, 30 years ago, a typical game was $50 to $80. So this is still within the realm of normal, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. In the realm of normal? Wendy, what did you (laughs) Wait a minute. Why does she get the normal tag? (laughs) <laughs> because we're not normal. Okay, fine. You don't know me very well, do you? Okay, out of this lot, you're the normal. <laughs> out of this nut, you're the only one that they don't toss in the ground. Anyway, this week I was able to get that mic test done like I was wanting to do, and I involved the kids in it. Sometimes you have to combine things that you're doing with the kids in order to get stuff done during the week. And this is one of those cases we had to do some stuff for school that involves some video. So I was like, hmm, since we've got to do that anyway, how about I hook this new mic to the children and see how well it works? The youngest is the one that had the hardest part with it. And it was more the way it was connected to his shirt. He kept fiddling with it and pulling it away from him and wanting to touch it. And that was really a good test. I do have to say that because it is a lavalier mic, holy crap, it picks up absolutely everything going on in the house. The video was being done in the living room. And because all of the kids were there, I needed them all around. They were working on different projects at the time. Stuff was shuffling. The youngest was playing. You could hear all of that stuff. Like it really does pick up everything going on in the room. I didn't bring out all my gear for this case. I left the Atomos Ninja in its box. There was just too many kids around with lighting and that kind of stuff to have one more thing in the way for somebody to trip over. So the mic was connected directly into my camera and I shot that the regular compress of my Nikon. It didn't need to be super high quality. Actually, for where I needed to upload them to, the smaller the file was, the better. So compression was not an issue, especially where lighting was good. There was no tweaking that. That way, opened it up in KDN Live and started scrubbing through it. And I'm like, oh my goodness, 
there's all kinds of noise going on. I thought about tweaking the audio in KDN Live itself. And since I'm already trying to learn Audacity, why don't I pull the sound files into there? So that's exactly what I did. This is really cool thing. It is a .mov, a movie file. I opened the movie file directly into Audacity. There was no, do you want to convert, whatever. It opened the audio file. I made the tweaks and changes that I wanted into that. Deleted the one that was connected to the original movie file in KDN Live. Added the edited audio file to it. Relocked them together. Finished up really quick. It wasn't any detailed editing work in both the audio side or the video side, and then sent them off to where they needed to go. I have to say that while it's probably not the cleanest audio ever, it still is a pretty good lavalier mic. And then with post production, we should have a fantastic camera corner. Can you give us a preview of what we can expect on the first episode? The first episode, I'd really like to use some natural light and a window in order to set up several different shots. I would like to do some with people because I've had some fun taking pictures of people, but I don't know that I necessarily want to involve my children in those videos. So I need somebody who is willing I might be able to talk my husband into it because I've been able to talk him into helping as I'm learning different things. So he might be willing to help. We'll just have to see how it goes. But the first one will definitely be some still life type stuff using a window. Most people have a table, something like that. They have a window that they can use. And it's a great place in being able to get some shots with stuff that you have already. I just like that you can use your husband as a guinea pig of sorts. I get a lot of amusement as out of that. a test subject. That's good stuff right there. <laughs> when I I was taking the one photography class. I needed someone to sit for a product shot. People had to be involved in it. And I was like, but it's for school. It's for science. I mean, school. It's for this class. It's to help me get better. He's like, oh, all right, I'll do it. He hates having his picture taken. Absolutely hates it. In other words, you guilt tripped him. Yes, and he loves me, so he did it. We'd like to continue this discussion with you on Telegram in Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLN website for information on how to connect with our social channels, all of the shows, and creators at destinationlinux.network. For more information on me, you can go to cubiclenate.com. Links to my regular written blatherings, podcast, and YouTube channel can be found there. And you can find my random ramblings on Twitter at MattDLN. You can find me on Mastodon at WendyDLN at Mastodon.online. Make sure you join us next weekend. Sunday, March 21st for the DLN Lugfest right after the live recording of Destination Linux around 3 to 3.30 Eastern Time. You do not have to be a patron to participate in the lug. Make sure you are logged in to the DLN discourse form and there will be a thread with a link to join the lug. Hope to see you there. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another fantastic episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everyone.